Hey guys, it's Liam Blake from Refine Horizons, and I know it's been a while since I did some of these videos, but get caught up today. So, I'm going to talk about in this video Brown's Boundary Control Legal Principles, Boundary Surveying Bible. I'm going to cover Chapter 4. So, Chapter 4 Browns. Chapter 4 Browns is all about the land surveyor and his role in court. So, and I think that uh, the chapter maybe should have been called that. <laughs> I think it should have been called the boundary surveyor in court. Browns boundary control. We're doing chapter three. Oh, nope, sorry, chapter four today. Chapter four. Okay, so the ti actual title, let's just see what the actual title is. The actual title of chapter four is Boundaries Law and Presumptions. I think a better title would have been uh, The Role of the Boundary Surveyor in Court or The Role of the Boundary Surveyor in the Legal System, although I don't know if the chapter is quite that broad. So I've got the study notes done. I will post those online for this chapter. There's some key terms there we're not going to go over. I don't usually go over those in the video. So let's go over our key concepts. Now, again, I was a little confused about how the authors structured the chapter in the in uh, the structure of the content in this particular chapter, and so I rearranged that just a little bit in my key concepts. So you may notice if you if you're following along in your copy of the book that there are some slight differences. I'm going to jump around a little bit compared to how they laid out the chapter. So the first key concept that I think it's important to talk about in chapter four is why should the land surveyor care? Why should you care? If you're a land surveyor about the legal system or about how things work in court, which is what this chapter talks about. And the main reason they identify it in the book, chapter four, is that the land surveyor may be called upon to serve as an expert witness. And I agree with that. That is very important. And I have personally served as an expert witness in a number of cases. However, I don't think that's the most important reason for a boundary surveyor to understand how our legal system works or to understand how court works. Because the majority of boundary surveyors will never serve as an expert witness. Uh, I should say the majority of land surveyors will never survey, serve as an expert witness, and even most boundary surveyors will probably not serve as an expert witness. That, that's kind of a unique service to offer, and uh, most surveyors don't like doing it. So um, I don't want you to think, well, if I'm, I, I don't plan on ever being an expert witness, so I don't need to know how the legal system works. That's not true. So The chapter's kind of structured for the land surveyor that wants to be an expert witness, boundary surveyor that wants to be an expert witness, but I don't think that's why most land surveyors should care. So why should you care? If you do boundary surveys, um, I think there's two reasons why you should care. Uh, you want to be able to provide your client with legally correct boundary resolutions. So the only way to, to properly and correctly resolve a client's parcel boundary is if you understand the law, right? Because ultimately the courts get to decide where the boundary's at, based on the rules of law, right? So you want to try and follow those same rules when you do a boundary survey, within reason, and you want to be able to defend your own work. So it's a licensed land surveyor, at least in California, and in most other places in the United States, you are liable if you apply incorrect legal principles in your boundary resolution. So you need to know the law if you're going to be a boundary surveyor. You need to know property law. But the chapter is structured kind of for the, the boundary surveyor that wants to be an expert witness. And so they mention in the chapter the duties of the land surveyor as an expert witness basically include two things. One is to collect and present evidence of facts, right? We primarily do that in the field, but we could also do that through our research and, anal and, and, and analyzing of land records in the office. So with that, that's one thing an expert witness does. He collects and presents evidence of facts. The second thing an expert witness does is he may be asked to offer opinions what do these particular set of facts mean to you as an expert? Or do uh, does the evidence that's been provided prove these facts? So I'll just give you an example. Um, in one of the cases I worked was a water rights case. One of the opinions I was asked is, based on what you see landed in this set of aerial photos and these other old maps, do you think this particular feature, linear feature here, used to be a stream? Okay, so that was an example of asking me for an opinion. All right, next topic. 
Next key concept, uh, the chapter early on, first couple pages, talks about four types of law in the U.S. legal system. I do think this is very important. The first is constitutional law. That's our U.S. Constitution. There are some rights related to real property in the U.S. Constitution. So one example is the government can't take your property without just compensation. The second type of law is what we call statute or written law. That's law, laws that are passed by legislature. And that's typically done at either uh, the state or local level. We do have federal statute, federal law. Um, it doesn't typically impact uh, re uh, real property in the United States because that most real property is governed at the state level. But um, So statute is law that's passed by legislature, written law. And it could be the U.S. Congress, a state Congress, or a city council or county board of supervisors. Third type is common law or case law. That's law that's made by judges. And then uh, the fourth type is administrative law. Okay, so that's regulations made by uh, government agencies, typically in the executive branch. As an example, I'm a licensed land surveyor. There are board rules or regulations from my licensing board, which is part of the Department of Consumer Affairs, which is part of the, the uh, California executive branch uh, run by the governor. Okay, so that's an example of... of uh, Regulatory law, as a general rule, as you move down that list, the laws have less and less weight. So, for example, you can't have administrative law or regulations that violate a constitutional principle. So, the Constitution is a higher source of law. I would add a fifth type of law, and I'm a little bit hesitant to do this, but uh, I would also say, you know, it's helpful for surveyors just to understand the rules that uh, the rules of court or the rules that govern how a lawsuit is executed. And, uh, and that definitely helps if you're going to be an expert witness. And uh, there's a really good book, not Brown's, different book. Uh, I don't have it with me or I'd show it to you, but it's called Surveying the Courtroom, a Land Expert to Sky. It's not a very thick book, so it's fairly easy to get through, but it talks all about the rules of court, the rules of evidence. It's kind of like taking this one chapter in Brown's and turning it into a small book. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to pick up a copy of that. The next concept they talk about in chapter four is the, is the concept of legal concept or doctrine of jurisdiction. And so that basically means, uh, jurisdiction means, does the court have the right to hear a case and to make a decision in the case? Uh, so, for example, um, some disputes have to be heard in the federal court, not in the state court. Um, so there, there's uh, special considerations when a federal law or federal land is involved in a dispute and that may require that a case be heard in federal court. Um, and there, there are other problems that can come up with jurisdiction. Uh, usually if, if you if you read court decisions, published court decisions, very early on in the decision in the first few pages, the court will explain why it believes it has jurisdiction to hear a case and, and issue a decision. So you can learn a little bit about that from those court decisions. Um, as I mentioned before, but just, I want to hit it again because Brown talks about it in Chapter 4, there is no federal land law. So uh, real estate law is typically governed at the state level. It's a matter of state law, not federal law. And even when you're in federal court, because federal uh, law is involved or federal land is involved, a lot of the dispute is going to be handled according to uh, the state law for the, for the state that the that the parcel is in. Okay, so really no body of federal land law. Um, some would argue that uh, land that has always been in the public domain, in other words, it's always been owned by the U.S. government, um, is governed by a set of federal rules, so like the BLM surveying manual. So you could argue in some sense there is federal law in that respect. Um, but, you know, in general, the rules for easements and deeds and and controlling elements and boundary surveys, almost all that is based in federal law and not in, sorry, based in state law, not in federal law. Okay, so what does a surveyor need to know about jurisdiction? Well, you know, you should understand the rules uh, that you're going to have to play by, uh, you know, the rules that your boundary survey will be judged by. So, for example, I'm licensed in both California and Nevada. Those states have very similar laws, but... They, they are different. They are different jurisdictions. So uh, it could be um, that I decide to handle a boundary resolution in Nevada differently than I do in California based on the rules of each of those states. 
something to think about. Uh, the next concept in chapter 4 is this concept of sovereign immunity. So back in ancient England, if you were the king, you know, people couldn't take you to court. You were you had the right or the power as a as a king not to be sued by your subjects. Uh, it's called immunity. Immunity means you can't get sued. It comes from the idea of you know, immunity as in you can't get sick. Right? So legal immunity means you can't get sued. Um, so we've carried that through into our common law. What it basically means is you can't sue the government without the government's permission as a general rule, especially the federal government. But because we're a democracy, Congress has, through time, passed laws that allow citizens in certain circumstances to sue the federal government if they have you know, certain conditions are met. I'm sure the same thing applies to the state governments. You're able to sue your state government if certain conditions are met. Um, but you can't just sue the government whenever you want. There's rules for when you can do that. That's the concept of sovereign immunity. Um, it also um, is directly related to this idea of unwritten rights. So you can't adversely possess against the sovereign. That's a general rule. There are some exceptions to that. Um, so, for example, if you acquired adverse possession while the land was privately owned before it was conveyed to the federal government or state government or city government, there, there's some exceptions. But as a general rule, you can't adversely possess against the sovereign. That's part of the sovereign immunity. That the, the sovereign enjoys, the government enjoys. Brown talks about this a little bit, and I haven't I haven't explored it deeply, but in the chapter he talks about how even if you are able to prove adverse possession against the government, um, you can't dispossess them of the property. All you're going to do is force them to compensate you for that property. Um, of course, we talked about that protection under the Constitution. Um, that's not something I've looked into um, extensively, but I wanted to mention it because it was brought up in the chapter. Okay, the other uh, legal concept is, uh, we've got uh, three more, is uh, judicial notice. So judicial notice means um, you ask the court to accept something as a fact based on the fact that it's, it's widely accepted. So for example, example in the book is the sun rises uh, every day in the east. So you could ask the court to just accept that as a fact without having to prove it. The whole idea of judicial notice is you don't want to have lawyers in lawsuits pro proven a bunch of widely accepted facts. If something's common knowledge or widely accepted, you can ask the court to just accept it. Um, that's important because the facts that are that are accepted um, are going to have, oftentimes, have an impact on the decision. Um, I don't think I want to say anything more about uh, judicial notice. Just uh, um, allows widely accepted facts to be accepted without being proven. Then there's the, the legal concept of available evidence that Browns talks about. It's just one of many rules related to evidence. I encourage you to pick up that other book I talked about. There's a whole just two or three different chapters just about evidence in the land surveying. Uh, but available evidence is one rule that Browns talks about in chapter four. What basically what it, the, the rules basically that court cases aren't open-ended. So and, and there's practical reasons for that, right? So in order to keep our legal system moving, at some point you have to tell the lawyers you can't submit any more evidence. We're going to make we're going to make a decision in this dispute based on the evidence that's available. Right. So there's a limited period of time in which evidence can be presented. Why is this important for surveyors? What that means is when you're out there doing your field survey or your office research, you better find all the evidence that can have an impact on your boundary, <laughs> because um, if you don't find all the evidence and there's a lawsuit and a decision is made and somebody comes back later and says, hey, there was evidence that would have led to a different decision, um, you can be sued by your client uh, because your, your client may have limited ability to go back to the court to get, uh, to get a remedy. If you as the surveyor say, here's the evidence, judge, that you need to use to decide where this boundary goes, and the judge makes a decision and you didn't find all the evidence, and that harms your client, and then your, your client isn't able to change that decision after the fact, which in most cases they won't be able to, you could be liable. You could be liable to your, to your client for damages. So it's really important for land surveyors to do a diligent search for evidence during their survey. It could be evidence in the office or evidence in the field, right? Now, there's a related issue of negligence. You know, does that mean, uh, you know, does that mean you got to run a backhoe and dig a 20-foot hole for every corner? No, you have to do what the ordinarily prudent surveyor would do in your situation. That's somewhat nebulous or ambiguous, but 
the bottom line is you don't want somebody to come behind you and find a monument that you should have found with a reasonable effort because uh, it creates problems. So you got to find all the evidence before you do your boundary resolution um, because your ability to change a court decision about a boundary after the fact is very limited. Okay. Uh, so an example of that <clears throat> that I just wrote down is... Uh, Let's say you go out and do a survey and you don't find some original controlling monuments. And so you proportion or you prorate and uh, that goes to court and the court says, yep, Landon did the right thing based on the available evidence. I like his prorated solution. That's where the line goes. Okay. Later on, somebody else finds an original monument that you didn't find that would have given your client another 20 feet of land. Uh, your client's not going to be able to go back to the judge and present that additional evidence because the judge has already decided where the line is at. You could be liable. So find all the evidence. Then there's the uh, the legal concept of presumption. Presumptions, excuse me. So presumptions are a substitute for evidence. Presumptions are a statement of fact or law that can be considered as true without further legal proof. Okay. Um, So an example is um, you could presume that uh, if a surveyor says that he set a monument at a certain location on a certain date and he put that on his file map, that that's true. Okay, so you'd have to have conclusive proof that he didn't do that to be able to, to prove that it wasn't true. That's an example of a presumption. So uh, presumptions, you can't base them on another presumption, so you can't build a chain of presumptions. Um, and so why do we have presumptions? It's just like judicial judicial notice. We have presumptions because we're trying not to make lawyers prove every little detail or every little fact in a lawsuit. We're trying to we're trying to let the lawyers argue about the facts that are really important. Uh, presumptions. Uh, uh, if you're going to use a presumption as a general rule, it has to be allowed by law. So it has to be established by statute or common law. Um, there's two types of presumptions that are allowed. One is uh, conclusive. And the other is uh, rebuttable. So conclusive presumptions are not very common. Um, they are uh, uh, a presumption that can't be rebutted. So they have to be accepted as true, even if there's evidence to the contrary. Um, and Browns doesn't have a good example from boundary law. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, he gives an example from criminal law. You can't be accused of a felony if you're a minor. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a conclusive presumption. So even if you want to prove that that minor acted like an adult or knew what he was doing, uh, you still might not be able to convict him with, with a felony because the presumption that a minor can't be convicted with a, fel with a felony is a conclusive presumption, not rebuttable. So most most presumptions that land surveyors deal with in boundary law are rebuttable, not conclusive, which means if you have enough evidence, you can overturn the presumption. Why is that important? Uh, because if you're a land surveyor, you don't want to rely on presumptions. You want to look for all the evidence. <laughs> Um, so, for example, if there's a legal presumption that the surveyor did what he said on his map, he said that he or she set that monument at that corner on that date. Um, you don't want to just rely on that presumption as a land surveyor. you got to actually go look for the corner, see if you find it. Uh, right. So the, the point that Browns makes is legal presumptions are important in boundary disputes and you should understand them, but don't rely on them. Your job as a land surveyor is to look for all the evidence. Um... Uh, here's another example uh, that I came up with that I thought of. So let's say you have a, a boundary survey map and it, it only it only shows found monuments. It doesn't show that the surveyor set any monuments. Uh, does that mean you shouldn't go look at the corners for set monuments? Not necessarily. Maybe he did set monuments and he just didn't put it on his map or she didn't put it on her map. Uh, so you should go look. Potentially you should go look, right? So be careful with presumptions. Um, inferences are a little bit like presumptions. Uh, but they're, they're conclusions that can be deduced logically, you know, from facts. So they, they're not based on a legal allowance or a legal rule. You can just argue an inference based on the facts. Okay, so uh, an example that I came up with is you find a monument. It's in the record position. In other words, it agrees with the measurements to other monuments. It's of the record character. So the surveyor says he set a, a one-inch iron pipe. You find a one-inch iron pipe. What's the inference? Well, you could infer from those facts that the monument is actually the monument that was set on the map by the surveyor. Okay, so that's a way to just logically make those conclusions based on the facts. Of course, you could argue otherwise. You could argue it was a different pipe. 
Um, but you could infer, a lawyer could infer from those facts that it, that pipe you found is in fact the pipe that was set on the, uh, on the original survey. Uh, there's a whole list of specific presumptions related to boundary surveys that are given in the book. I'm not going to read those all to you, but you should read them and understand them. Uh, I'd, lo I'd love to do a separate video about those. Um, I'm going to try and do some more research about common legal presumptions related to boundary surveys. I think that would be interesting. There's, some rep there's a reference given in the book that I'm going to try and dig up. So we might talk about more about that in a different video. Okay, then there's kind of three just oddball topics that I feel like kind of got tucked in this chapter. I don't know why they're somewhat related, but they just they seem a little bit out of place to me. But I want to talk about them. So one is the disposing of federal lands. I think the reason this is in chapter four is because Brown's talking about sovereign immunity and uh, the federal jur this jurisdiction of federal courts. I think that's why this got put in here. Uh, but basically, there's special rules for how federal land can be disposed of. Um, you know, if you work at a government agency, you can't just get rid of the government's land. There's special rules you got to follow. Uh, the United States Congress decides how federal agencies can dispose of their land, so Congress has the authority to decide how that's done. Some federal agencies are allowed to get rid of their land, some are not. And then Browns talks about three specific legislative acts that allow uh, federal land to be disposed of. One is called the Color of Title Act. That that's from 1928. That basically says, you know, if you occupy the government's land in good faith, you know, for example, because you were an adjoiner, because you had an incorrect deed or something, uh, the government uh, may choose to give you that land. You could ask for that land and they may choose to sell it to you. Uh, then there's Public Law 120. I don't understand a lot about that. There's only a short paragraph in the book. I need to, I need to research more about it. And then there's the Small Tracts Act, which I know a little bit about. That's uh, for the Forest Service. If you uh, mistakenly occupy a small part of the Forest Service land, you can do a land swap with the Forest Service. Then this other, uh, there's this other section that it's kind of doesn't fit, and it just talks about researching the law. I think it's really important. Um, I'm not sure. It just seemed out of place in this chapter. Um, but you know, it's important. How do you learn the, learn about the law and the rules of court? You got to do that through research. So there's a couple different kinds of laws that surveyors need to know about. So there's laws that govern how you practice land surveying. So in California, that statute, we have the California um, Business and Profession Code, uh, what we call the Land Surveyors Act, and we have the Subdivision Map Act that governs subdivisions. So those are examples of statute at the state level. Then we have, I talked about the board rules, that's an example of regulations, so you need to know about that. Uh, boundary surveyors in particular need to understand other areas of statute that relate to their work. It's typically state law, so that's all the real estate law that you need to know as a land surveyor. And you need to know about adverse possession, about prescriptive rights, statutes of frauds, requirements for valid deeds, easements. Um, it's all kinds of stuff you need to know about. So how do you understand that law? You know, well, you have to read it. You have to read the statute. You have to read court cases. Um, they talk about in the chapter some different things that help you with that. Legal encyclopedias that offer information about specific uh, legal topics. American law reports do the same thing. Um, they talk about, um, you know, court reports where, where uh, court decisions are published. Um, they're called reporters. There's usually one for each state. Uh, they can, there's reporters for other jurisdictions like federal courts. Um, that, that used to be really important. It's not as important now that we have online research tools, but you can still go to a law library and get the court reporters to look at cases. Um, he talks a little bit about shepherdizing. You know, that's this process of, of online research now that you can do that reveals cases related to the case that you're reading or cases, newer cases that might overturn an older decision that you're reading. So that's important. And then finally, the last thing that's just kind of a little bit oddball, I mean, I understand why it's in the chapter, but it's just a little bit out of place is this concept of identifying the landowners that are subject to a lawsuit. And basically what they're, what they're saying in the chapter is if you have a boundary dispute, and you don't identify all the parties with a vested right in that boundary, then whatever legal solution you go to court to, to get um, may not be effective because it doesn't include all the parties. So you have an obligation if you're going to legally fix a boundary through some type of court action or legal action to identify all the parties that might have a right in that land. 
They have a right to due process right, right? They have a right to be heard. Um, and so it's really important that you don't screw that up. And, you know, in the book, they talk a little bit about, hey, the land surveyor, you know, it's really the attorney, land attorney's job to make sure all those parties get named. But of course, the land surveyor can help the land attorney identify the parties that are going to have an interest in a particular piece of property or, or in a particular boundary. Whew, there you go. Chapter four, that was a bunch. Hopefully you guys didn't fall asleep. Um, it's all about, uh, you know, the land surveyor and his role in court, in court or her role in court and kind of how our legal system works. Um, like I said, there's whole books devoted to the topics covered in that chapter. So it's a good introduction, but it's not going to teach you everything you need to know about the law for sure, especially if you want to be an expert boundary surveyor, an excellent boundary surveyor. But hope you guys enjoyed the video and, um, I'll try to get to another chapter of Brown's boundary control and legal principles in the near future for you guys.